Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to our illustrious get together. And uh, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, the college consists of the following format. There'll be a few announcements coming from Charlie. Then we'll have our speaker, Teresa Ma, will be then speak up to about an hour or so. Then we'll have our question and answer period. And then, of course, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. And Teresa, if you got to go early, we understand, but we encourage you to stick around because you will get the last word. <laughs> our uh, our uh, illustrious group here does tend to uh, get a little bit crazy. I'm uh, what we call, I'm, I guess I'm becoming what we call a rhino, a rhino Republican in name only, but uh, I like a lot of the principals don't like Trump. That's another story. All right. Hi. Let's get started with the announcements. Oh, by the way, there are two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. That means, again, right. Charlie a schmuck, and I don't think I'll do so tonight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's get ready. I'm going to put the announcement screen up, Charlie, when you're ready. So Yeah, uh, I'm set. All right, I got to get the... Uh, shoot, I got the damn one wrong. Ah, come on, Tim. Come on, I got the wrong browser up. My apologies here, please. Give me a minute, I gotta get this back. Uh, come on, this is not not doing a uh, pause share. Stop share for a minute, try again. We'll get these announcements going in just a second. Okay, there we go. Screen share again. I guess this is what happens when you are a little late getting in sometimes. Okay, Charlie, go ahead with the announcements. Okay, I would like to welcome everyone to meeting number 3,688 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, a little business we'd like to get taken care of. I would like to request that everyone please mute Mute yourselves, put a nice red X over your microphone in respect for our speaker. Uh, right now, kindly mute yourselves. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, the, uh, um, the, um, by the way, the recording of last week's program is in our lecture library if anyone like to would like to catch up and was not able to attend that presentation um okay now we also have a we operate two notification email systems uh one is a google group a google email group which there are instructions in the top center on joining see it's very very quick and easy, um, even to those, no challenge. So we have a Google email group, and we also have a meetup group that functions in much the same fashion with little or no traffic uh, during the week. Now, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On October the 22nd, sure. the independent voters of Illinois the state chair, James Garfield, and other uh, committee members, such as myself, will be doing a presentation on how to be an informed voter in preparation for the election on November the 8th. We'll be looking over the sample ballots and you'll get to see how an endorsement process is undertaken, which we just completed at IVI. Um, transitioning into October 29th, uh, we will be welcoming Joe Jennings uh, from our campus, our other campus, uh, who's put together a very informative and wide ranging illustrated discussion on uh, the war in the Ukraine and NATO, the history of NATO and so forth. So this will bring you up to date re regarding the circum situation uh, in that part of the world. Um, on November the 5th, although it has not been formally announced, 
I notified our restaurant, a regular meeting place, that we intend to resume meeting in a in a face-to-face -face basis on that date. So if you'd like to speak, uh, please contact me. We have not made completed yet technical arrangements for simulcasting, simulcast presentation on Zoom and or um, YouTube. YouTube. But we are that is in progress and we'll be working on it in the period preceding that. That's okay, yours. now now going on, um, on November the 12th, yours truly, Charles Paydock. I thought I'd do something totally a little bit different. We have a historical program regarding the conflict, the communists versus the fascism. There's a, the conflict in the past was against fascism, but I'm going to bring in, uh, uh, put together very, what I think, it's a fascinating insight for most Americans know a great deal about the World War II as it took place in the West, and they know virtually little or nothing about the war that took place in the East, which was which many historians regard as the place where the outcome of that conflict was finally decided. Okay, that's about it. Uh, and the, we have to We've got other opening dates, 12th, 19th, and so forth in November. So if you'd like to get on the schedule, please contact me. And that's it, Tim. Thank you very much. All right, Teresa. Sorry about the background noise. That's uh, my mom watching TV in the other room. But we'll be ready to go. So I'll mute myself, and I'll just let you take over. And uh, Teresa, introducing State Teresa Maher, State Rep, and... Uh, Let's proceed from here and get going with our presentation. Okay, well, uh, good evening. Good to be with you all tonight. Um, I'm Teresa Ma, I'm state representative for what is currently the second state house district. Um, that includes the city of Chicago neighborhoods of Chinatown, Bridgeport, Pilsen, McKinley Park, Brighton Park, and Back of the Arts. And I've been state representative here since 2017. Um, I, I ran um, a campaign in uh, and won in, in 2016. And when I won my election, I became the first Asian American to serve and to be elected to the Illinois General Assembly. Um, so I uh, now uh, we actually have five Asian Americans in the General Assembly, and um, in keeping with the growth in our population um, and uh, increasing interest among uh, folks who want to represent their communities, uh, this year we could potentially double our caucus in, in the General Assembly. And after November 8th, we'll find out if uh, we might have 10 members of uh, 10 members who uh, trace their heritage back to Asia um, and are Asian Americans. Um, so in the General Assembly, um, I, I now uh, chair the uh, healthcare licenses uh, committee in the House, and um, I have a leadership position where I'm the Asian American Caucus Whip, um, and uh, I have an office here in uh, McKinley Park at 35th and Archer, um, and I I really enjoy my job. I, I um, wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got here, though, because, you know, I didn't always um, plan to run for office and, and uh, serve in, um, in public office. I, I started my career in an entirely different direction. I actually um, grew up in San Francisco, California and went to UC Berkeley for college. And I ended up in Illinois um, because I was accepted into the PhD program at the University of Chicago. 
Um, so, you know, I got here 31 years ago and um, worked on a PhD, finished my PhD and uh, thought I was going to, you know, be in a, a, a career as a college professor for the rest of my life. Little did I know that at some point um, my career would, would uh, go in a different direction. But, um, you know, when I, when I got into academia, what I studied was um, U.S. history, um, 20th century uh, U.S. history with a focus on, you know, understanding how, um, you know, our, our, you know, structures of, of inequality developed in this country, particularly with regard to um, race and racism. I wrote my dissertation on um, politics of housing segregation and the history of housing segregation in the in the 20th century. And, um, you know, I taught uh, classes in US history, Asian American history, um, uh, ethnic studies. And I did that for a number of years. Um, but, uh, you know, I was I was teaching at one point in uh, Northwest Ohio. And, it, you know, it was it was good for a little while, but I, you know, decided I didn't really want to stay there. So I didn't go up for tenure and I came back to Chicago and uh, continued to um, teach and, and do administrative work in academia for a little while. And then um, at, at one point sort of took my career in a different direction and uh, started working for nonprofit organizations, including the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Um, I then uh, worked in Chinatown, came back to Chinatown and um, did some community engagement and policy work, community organizing, um, you know, the, the population here really didn't have any representation. And, you know, when I was helping to get the attention of elected officials to let folks know what folks needed here in this neighborhood, um, which had been, you know, growing tremendously over the last couple of decades, um, you know, I, I, I got people um, to, to pay attention to um, what they needed to do to, to get more resources. You know, I registered voters and, and uh, you know, organized people to speak up about their, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things they needed. You know, for example, they, uh, there was a need for um, a, a larger library because the community had um, outgrown the storefront that was on Wentworth, um, street and um and uh you know folks were you know, sitting on the floor waiting in line to use the computers and and to you know wait for a seat to to sit and and read their books and they had the the second highest um checkout rate of the entire um cpl system and so you know we we pushed and pushed and finally got a new library built in Chinatown. Um, but, you know, I realized also that unless, um, you know, somebody had a seat at the table, you know, it wasn't going to be that easy to continue to get resources for the community and to have the community's voice heard. And so, you know, I, I thought, um, you know, in the, in the back of my mind, you know, maybe that one day I would run um, but, you know, this was back in, um, you know, 2011, 2012, um, we were working on redistricting in the area because um, the Chinese population had been split into four different state representative districts and the population really didn't have any voting power to ask their elected officials to do anything for them. Um, you know, the buck would always be passed and, you know, an elected official could say, well, you know, so-and-so has more population over there, so why don't you ask him for what you want? So we had the opportunity in 2011 to change the boundaries of um, 
the the state house districts you know this is something that happens every 10 years after the census uh, with redistricting right um, we just experienced um, redistricting this past year um, in 2021 and you know it's it's um, a, a process that is um, written into the Constitution you know we have to do reapportionment of the congressional districts every 10 years um, as well as the state and local um, uh, boundaries as well. And this is so that, you know, when, when you have population movement and shifts, you can um, redraw the boundaries so that the, the population remains the same for all the districts. So everybody has um, the same voting power, right? And so in 2010, I had the opportunity to work on um, this process of redistricting for, for this area. And we were able to um, draw a district that included um, about 90 95% of um, the Asian American population so that they'd be all in one district and would have the opportunity to influence an election um, and vote for someone that, um, that they wanted. And so, you know, during that process, you know, I thought in the back of my mind, well, you know, maybe one day I could, I could run for this seat, um, but um, it was still a few years off. Um, and uh, in 2013, I had the opportunity to join uh, Governor Quinn's staff. Um, I did that so that, um, you know, I could take on some of the responsibility of, you know, letting him know, um, you know, what some of the concerns and um, interests were of the Asian American community statewide. So, you know, back then, according to the census um, in 2010, um, the Asian American community statewide was about 5% of the state population. Um, you know, that was about 600,000 people, but, you know, at the time there was, there was still no Asian American elected to the General Assembly. Um, in 2011, we uh, elected the first Asian American to um, the uh, city council, to the Chicago City Council, um, but that was just, you know, one, um, you know, one major body in the state, but, um, but no one at the state level. Um, so, you know, I did some work for Governor Quinn for the last two years of his administration, where I basically um, was in charge of outreach to the Asian American community, and, um, you know, worked on legislation and policy, um, whenever, you know, something arose that, that um, became apparent um, that uh, it was something that the community wanted and, and needed to, to address. Um, and, uh, you know, I would have been happy to stay in that job, but as you all know, in 2014, um, Quinn didn't get reelected. And so I had to figure out what to do next. Um, in early 2015, I, I jumped on to Chewy Garcia's uh, campaign for mayor. Um, you know, just to tide me over while I figured out what to do next. And um, unfortunately, you know, he fell short uh, by a little bit, you know, in his attempt to um, beat Rahm Emanuel. So, um, so, you know, that was um, mid 2015, April, I guess, when we found out um, the results of that campaign. And, um, you know, I was still undecided as to what I would do. I had heard a rumor that my predecessor, um, Eddie Acevedo, uh, was planning to retire. And I thought that, okay, that might be an opportunity. Um, and I had to decide whether I would run, whether he retired or not, because, you know, he was um, in leadership under Madigan and, um, um, and, you know, it would have been hard to beat an incumbent. Well, when he did announce his retirement, he also announced that he wanted his son to take his place. 
And at that moment, when I found out, I decided, okay, well, I, I can't let that happen because, you know, I, I didn't like him as my state rep and I certainly wouldn't like his son. And so I decided at, at that time to jump into the race and announce my candidacy. I, um, I made my case to voters around the district. I knocked on a lot of doors, went to uh, community events, introduced myself and, you know, talked about my vision, my values, you know, what I hope to do for the people in the second district. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an uphill battle. Um, you know, I ran against the son of a 20 year incumbent and uh, the former speaker endorsed my opponent. So I ran as an underdog. Um, he had name recognition, you know, although that was double-edged. Um, but, um, you know, I still had to make my case and I had to build a campaign that, that would win. And I ended up doing that by uh, running a campaign with volunteers who could reach out to voters in three different languages, Chinese, Spanish, and English. You know, the demographics of the district were such that, you know, over 50% are uh, Latino, 25% were Asian, and 20% uh, or so uh, were white and very small percentage of African Americans. And so in order to win that race, I had to expand the electorate, you know, get people out to vote who hadn't voted before. I had to reach them and convince them to turn out because, you know, even though, um, you know, out of the district population of 110,000, you know, you might have half of those who are registered to vote, but you know, another half of those registered voters who actually turn out to vote and during the primary, you know, which is when my election is um, for the most part, um, the numbers are even lower. And so, you know, we had to work really hard to uh, get the volunteers and um, talk to people at the doors and convince them about the importance of the election. And, you know, I think that that was ultimately what helped to decide the the race because you know I was able to uh, convince people that um, you know I had already um, you know worked done a lot in the community at, as a an activist and you know I had, had helped to um, you know get a library built in Chinatown and in Bridgeport you know working with folks like Charles you know we. Uh, uh, were involved in a campaign to bring back the 31st Street bus. And so, you know, there were accomplishments that I could point to and volunteers that I had met along the way getting all these things done that um, I could, you know, get involved in the campaign. And um, and the Chinese voters, you know, they were excited to, to vote for somebody who um, looked like them, could speak their language and, and could um, understand their needs. And, um, you know, they uh, got involved in, in a historic, what would be a historic um, election. And so ultimately, you know, I, I won by uh, 600 votes. And, you know, it was, you know, because um, I reached out to, you know, all the voters and um, made my case, but also expanded the electorate. And, and I think that the voters, the voters made the right decision, right? Because, you know, my predecessor and my, his son, my former opponent, you know, they've recently been in the news, right? You know, just yesterday, my predecessor was in the news for being involved in another scandal involving Mike Madigan, um, you know, where he was, um, he was, uh, you know, paid for a, basically a no-show job, um, you know, and, uh, and that was you know, on top of what he'd been indicted and convicted on before, right, him and his his two sons were, um, you know, charged with um, tax fraud, and and um, you know he he's already been sentenced to six months in in prison, and you know my former opponent is also 
Um, you know, he's been indicted and, and uh, I, I think that that's um, making its way through the, the judicial process. But um, the point is that um, the voters made the right decision. And, um, and, you know, since I've been elected, um, you know, I've really worked hard to uh, distance myself from the system that came before me, right? So, you know, very clearly my predecessor was part of this patronage system where, you know, loyal soldiers who, um, you know, turned out voters and, and served as precinct captains and, um, you know, in exchange for jobs and favors and things like that, um, you know, that system hopefully is, you know, well behind us, especially, you know, in, in um, you know, what is the second district. I mean, I know there are still pockets where some of it might still remain, but, you know, it's not something that I have anything to do with because, you know, my intention all along was to be elected so that I could give voice to um, the voters and, and work in their interests, not in my own interest, right? Like, you know, my predecessor and folks like him and the patronage, under the patronage, excuse me, patronage system, um, were only interested in, in themselves and, and, you know, how much gain and power they could accumulate for themselves and their families instead of serving the people that, um, you know, they were elected to serve. And so it's been really important to me. And one of the reasons I enjoy my job so much is, you know, I have made it, you know, my mission to, you know, do what I can to give voice to the people that I've been elected to, to serve. Um, and, and many of those people are folks that haven't really had much of a voice and, um, and you know, really need somebody to advocate for them and, and be a champion of um, their interests. So, you know, my district is made up of um, a majority of, of immigrant families, um, Latino and Asian. And, um, you know, most folks are, are um, you know, working class, um, or I have, I also have quite a few seniors who are, you know, really living on fixed incomes and, and struggling and, and living in poverty. 20% 20, 20 of, of the um, people I represent live be below the poverty line and 10% um, live, um, you know, in extreme poverty. And so, you know, I have a responsibility to make sure that um, the folks that I have been elected to, to you know, be a voice for, that I am able to help them. And in my decisions um, in the General Assembly, what, you know, whether it's, um, you know, voting on bills or passing the budget, right, those are two um, big parts of my job, right? So, you know, every year we have to uh, decide on a budget and, and, and get it passed. And, you know, we consider bills that are uh, proposed by myself and my colleague. And, um, and then I run a, a district office where, you know, we help constituents um, problem solve, you know, if they're um, dealing with, you know, any issues with any of the state agencies um, and they're running into bureaucracy and they need um, someone to help cut through that bureaucracy. We're there to problem solve for them. We have a lot of constituents whose first language is not English and they might need assistance, you know, applying for, um, um, you know, link cards or Medicaid um, or navigating the various um, programs that are available through our state agencies or processes like, um, you know, professional licensure, um, or, you know, if they have uh, family members or 
or loved ones who are incarcerated. We help them navigate the Department of Correction system. Um, you know, there are um, just a myriad of, of services that are offered by our state agencies. Um, and, um, you know, we, in our uh, constituent service capacity, you know, we, we are a liaison for our constituents um, to those agencies and, and we can help them. Um, so, you know, this has been a really rewarding job because I'm able to make a difference in people's lives every day. Um, you know, my parents came to this country in the late 60s as immigrants, you know, who, um, you know, didn't know very many people in this country, you know, had very few resources, um, didn't know the language all that well. And, um, you know, I grew up with firsthand knowledge of what that experience is like. Uh, I saw how hard they worked and the kinds of challenges that um, they had before them. And so that gives me some insight into, um, you know, the lives of the people that I represent, you know, my constituents, many of them are immigrants themselves and, um, you know, really struggle with um, a, a lot of things because of language barriers, you know, all kinds of um, barriers that that um, they go through because they're um, new to this country and, and facing a lot of struggles. And so, you know, my job is to do what I can now that I'm in a position to do so to, to make their lives easier and, you know, to help them thrive so that they can reach the American dream and um, their kids can um, succeed and, and, and do well and, and um, and uh, thrive as well, right? So um, because of that, you know, that drives a lot of um, my priorities in the General Assembly. Um, I serve on the um, K through 12 Education Appropriations Committee so that, um, you know, we can make sure that our public schools are adequately funded and um, are, um, um, and then there are programs that um, um, help to, you know, increase the uh, the diversity of our um, of our higher education system. That um, uh, that um, um, families, you know, just have the resources that they need. In the educational system, so you know, I've uh, my priorities have been um, public education, um, uh, you know, social services, making sure that our safety net is uh, there for the most vul most vulnerable populations. Um, I've worked on, I've done workers' rights, um, immigrant rights, consumer protection type legislation. Um, I work on uh, language access and um, bike safety. So, you know, those are just a number of um, um, areas where, where I've passed legislation, environmental issues as well. Um, and, and of course, every year when we work on the budget, you know, I fight for programs that um, that benefit my constituents, that my constituents need. Um, so, you, you know, I, I think that in state government, there's a lot of opportunity to touch people's lives and, you know, make sure that what, what I do and the decisions that I make um, have a positive impact on the people I serve. And that we're also um, doing the outreach to let people know uh, what resources there are. Um, that's an important part of my job too. And during the pandemic in particular, um, you know, we, we saw that, we saw the, the role, the importance of the role that elected officials 
had to play in um, you know, letting constituents know about the different programs that existed for them. So uh, for example, the various pandemic relief programs, you know, we had rental assistance, mortgage assistance, um, you know, uh, uh, business uh, relief, you know, programs. And, you know, I have a lot of small business owners in, in the district that, that, you know, really needed that help. But, you know, very few people, um, you know, knew about these programs unless we helped to spread the word, you know, and in some cases we had to go uh, door to door to um, some of the smaller immigrant owned businesses in my district to let them know that uh, they could apply and that if they needed language assistance or if they weren't computer literate, um, there was help for them. Um, you know, we also spread the word about the rental assistance and, um, and the uh, mortgage assistance programs, um, the, the programs for cash assistance that, that was available, um, and the fact that there were uh, fewer restrictions here in Illinois than in some other states, you know, so that everyone um, could have access. Um, so, you know, those are some, you know, just some of the, um, the things that, that um, I've worked on um, and, you know, what I'm about. And um, I don't know if this would be a good time to um, stop and, and let folks ask questions um, or, um, you know, if there's a particular area that you'd like me to talk more about, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think that um, um, I've Good. sort of covered the basics in terms of uh, uh, who I am and what I'm about. So I'll, I'll let you all take it from there and, and ask me to elaborate on areas that, that you want to hear more about. All right, I, I, we're, we're all going to, let's thank our speaker tonight. and. Uh, you guys know the routine. We ask a lot of questions tonight for us to come on in. Teresa, the first thing I'm going to ask is I make a lot of trips down to Bridgeport and, uh, you know, commuting in from Algonquin, sometimes out from Franklin Park. Can you update me as to when the Jane Byrne interchange is going to be finally completed? Or is that going to be another multi-year uh, project that's going to be constantly under construction? Um. So I don't have the timeline, um, you know, right at my fingertips, but I know that, you know, they're, they're continuing to work on that and trying to, you know, get through it as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I, I also, <laughs> I experience firsthand, um, you know, the, the construction issues as well. Um, you know, my hope is that it's sooner rather than later. Um, but, um, you know, there, there are certain things that can't be done in the, in the winter time. And so I think they're, they're trying to get as much done. Um, and then they'll probably have to resume, you know, after um, the winter weather, you know, delays because, you know, there's, you know, certain restriction, uh, I guess uh, limitations, you know, like certain temperatures when, when the concrete can't cure properly and that sort of thing. So, right, right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I can find out more about that. And, and uh, I, I, I was just looking it up um, a little while yeah. ago, and I was just curious. You know, you being a state rep and everything else. Uh, generally, why is it it takes so long for a lot of these construction projects to finish? We've had one here in Algonquin that's been five years in the making for a six mile stretch of road called Long Meadow Parkway. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's, uh, I don't know why it's taken so long to finish, but mm -hmm. that's another story. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the update. All right, Charlie, you got a question, so we'll let you go first. Yes, uh, when I went to vote at the primary, my standard polling place uh, was moved significantly as a matter of fact, all the precincts apparently were relocated to one park house. And later I was informed that there are 50% less precincts. 
is there going to be like one mega voting center per each ward? Is that the goal of the Board of Elections? Do you, are you aware of? No, um, you're, you're right in that um, there's been a consolidation of precincts and, um, and that uh, was related to uh, the ward redistricting process. And so, you know, after the, the ward boundaries were redrawn, they had to redraw the precincts. Um, and I think that they um, drew fewer precincts so that um, the, the precincts would be um, consolidated and, and um, include larger populations than previously. And I think that's partly related to, um, you know, a shortage of, of uh, precinct workers as well. So, um, you know, it's a combination of different things, but, um, you know, it came about because the precinct lines had to be redrawn. And um, I, I thought I heard something about um, um, a lawsuit that, that determined that the precincts had to be larger or um, something like that. But um, um, you're right that there are fewer maybe about 50% fewer precincts and, um, you know, they're encompassing a larger population, but um, also they were redrawn because the ward boundaries were redrawn. Okay. Uh, all right, let's got the next question. Um, Dan Carolina, go ahead, Dan, go ahead. Dan Carolina, go ahead, Dan, go ahead. Hey, got an echo. You got an echo, I think. Somebody. Well, hello. Yeah, we hello? can. We can yeah, hear we you. Can, we can hear you. There's a echo. There's a echo. Okay, I'll ask a question. Uh, uh, you're a state representative for uh, Chinatown, Pilsen. Where else? Bridgeport, Bridgeport. McKinley Park, um, Park, Brighton Park, and back of the yards. Okay. And then in, in the new map, I'll have a little bit of Canaryville. Okay. All right. I have a question about prisons, Pr Illinois prisons. Are you aware that they pay people maybe nine cents an hour for work? I know the, uh, L the U.S. Constitution says slavery is okay in prisons. It's not okay outside of prisons. So are you aware of that? The pay. I, I wasn't aware of that rate, but I... Can you look into it and get back to me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Let me write that down. Can I answer um, that? No, you can't try can it. I don't want to hear it. No. But, um, but I am opposed to, you know, what, I mean, it's essentially I agree with you that that is a, a, another form of slavery and, and you know, I don't agree with prison labor. Well, you know, according to the US Constitution that you uphold, it's, it's legal, totally legal. Slavery. Dad, could I answer that for you? I don't want to hear your, your answer, Charlie. I, well, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Thank it you. has nothing to do with the Constitution. It comes under the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, minimum wage law, and that's not the Constitution. And a prisoner many years ago did file a claim with the Department of Labor, sir, to get minimum wage, and he was not successful. That's all I know. Thank you. And it's not a constitutional issue. Okay. It's thanks. a statutory issue. And don't be so abrupt, Dan. Okay. We don't thanks. need that at the college, sir. Thank you, sir, for your answer. It's great. It's wonderful. Uh, thank you for your answer, Ref. Okay. Uh, are you done, Dan? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Margaret, you're next. So please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I apologize for being late. I, I'm sorry that I missed it. I want to know, in terms of the of your support for public education, did you address the fact that they're trying to put in a new school? Uh, it was a high school in your area, and when 
there are a, a couple of other public high schools that are suffering from low enrollment and basically what you're gonna do, I mean, what will happen when this school goes in um, is, and I'm not sure if it's a charter school or not, maybe you can tell me and maybe you already addressed this, but, but now I've got an echo. Now I've got an echo. Um, that, uh, you know, what are your feelings about that? And I know if, if you're aware of the situation that happened with Diet's DYETT school in, in Bronzeville um, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, about the teachers funding went out on hunger strike because of what was happening after uh, our fearless leader, Rahm Emanuel, closed 50 schools. Um, so, um, yeah, that's my question. Okay, well, thanks for the question. Yes, I am aware. And um, I don't know if, um, you know, you, you, you might have seen a couple weeks ago, um, I there was an article uh, in the Sun Times and um, my op-ed on the same day about um, my uh, decision to withhold the $50 million of funding um, for that school um, because the mayor had chosen a location that um, was a little too close to uh, those nearby schools that, that you mentioned. Um, you know, I, I, I stood with the, uh, the housing activists that, um, you know, were opposed to that site because um, th that's the site of the former Icky's homes and um, the residents had been promised that they could return um, to that area once um, new public housing um, or affordable housing was built there. And so, you know, there are a lot of problems with that particular site. And, um, you know, I made the decision to uh, hold hold up that money, those are um, the, the 50 million in, in state capital dollars that I originally requested and, and, and got um, because, uh, you know, there's been um, a lot of activism over the past uh, two, three decades in Chinatown for um, a school for that community. And, you know, when the mayor and CPS decided on this 24th and state uh, site, um, they didn't really fully consult the, the community um, and you know, went ahead with that plan despite a lot of controversy and um, you know, uh, disagreement over whether a new school should be built on that site. And, and so you know, my um, attempt was to hold up that process, you know, so um, you know, other sites could be investigated before, um, uh, you know, rather than that one. Um, and, you know, um, so that the mayor and CPS could do more um, authentic and meaningful community engagement because, you know, it seemed to me that that was a project that the mayor wanted to move forward um, because of her election coming up uh, rather than, you know, really what the community wanted. And, you know, and I, I am opposed to a school on that site, but, um, but I think that, you know, if it were farther away from um, the, the schools that, that um, are under enrolled and would be threatened, um, you know, I think that we could find a solution that would um, not um, threaten the closure of, of those schools. Um, you know, and, and part of what I had discussed with um, CTU and, and, you know, other advocates was that, you know, we could potentially build a school for the community and at the same time work on a way to um, move CPS away from enrollment based funding um, so that, you know, that the uh, decline in enrollment wouldn't be um, accelerated in, you know, in, in the event a, a new school could be built. So, 
Um, so yes, I'm I'm well aware of that uh, process and and um, you know got quite a bit of news coverage for um, for my decision oh. to um, oppose the mayor and, and pull back money. But unfortunately, the the school board went ahead and voted um, to approve the project uh, four to three, even though um, I don't know where they're going to get forty percent of that money. Um, Oh man. Anyway, yeah, I'm I, I apologize that I'm not keeping up. I'm a little busy where I am. But anyway, it, it doesn't matter. Um I mean it does matter. Um, I mean it does matter. So um, so, um I'll let Bob I'll let go Bob and go. boy, there's and a hell of an echo on, on here. Is there anything you can do about that, Tim? I think once once one of you mutes, the echo will go. I think it's Bob's computer, but uh, go ahead, Bob. You're next on the question. Okay, um, Teresa, um, would you uh, support legislation uh, allowing citizen status to be part of an individual's arrest record open to the public? I'm not understanding what uh, citizenship status. Yeah, he's wanting to know. Uh, <laughs> citizen. Uh, the hacker comes in sometimes. We have him once in a blue moon come in, so I got rid of him. So my apologies. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, uh, I don't, I don't know that that would be. Um something that uh i mean why would that be relevant why would that be relevant well i don't think that uh people would like to know that for instance uh uh if a uh, a drunk driver is a illegal alien that uh maybe you know he should be deported or even if he was uh a recent uh uh immigrant given given some type of status shouldn't uh, some of these uh, criminal arrests or convictions shouldn't they shouldn't they be uh, uh, you know deported? I mean, uh, why 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 should we have to keep living with these you know re re repeat offenders uh, that aren't even supposed to be here you know to begin with? They're here illegally anyway. Well, uh, but um, it seems like I mean, so. I, I would tend to disagree with, um, you know, I, so here, here's the thing, um, you know, there are already laws in place that where, you know, if, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, folks who are uh, here without proper documentation and authorization. In other words, illegal, they illegal would aliens be, is what you're trying to say. Well, you know, I, I don't agree with, with that terminology. So, um, well, well, it's, that it's, terminology. It's, it's true. Okay. So anyway, go ahead, go ahead, continue. Yeah. So, um, you know, there are already, uh, laws in place where, you know, folks who are, are here and not authorized to be here and, and, you know, if they break the law, then, you know, there are systems that would, um, you know, you know, they, they would potentially, you know, get deported. So that's not something that, that, you know, we need to legislate because it's. I mean, I don't think it even comes up in court. I don't even think it comes up in court. Does it, uh, what the citizen status is uh, of an offender? Let's say for instance, uh, again, I'm just right now thinking about uh, individuals uh, that have committed a DUI uh, and, you know, and, and injured uh, somebody. Uh, when they go to court, uh, I don't think their citizen status is even uh, presented to the judge or is even asked or even comes up. It's just, they just treat this as a as a DUI like anybody else. And it would get um, convicted like a DUI, you know, like everybody else. And then, so, then they come back know, and they I, do it a second, third time. I'm thinking of uh, one particular case uh, uh, that someone's now uh you know on their third time around 
Um, does it seem fair to, to uh, you know, that we have these people coming in our country uh, and breaking our laws and they get to keep staying here and doing this? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't remember ever voting on anything like that. Well, Nobody asked so there me. are federal laws that, that govern immigration, um, but, you know, I operate at the state level, so I don't have jurisdiction over those federal laws. But in Illinois, you know, we have actually um, passed a lot of legislation to make the state a welcoming state for immigrants because, you know, I, I guess I would have to disagree with this character, character, characterization that the majority of immigrants are uh, criminals. So I, you know, I don't personally don't believe that. And well, I don't know if anybody you know, said that was a majority of them, but, uh, but, but there's but, certain, you know, I mean, I think certain that there's certain, um, you know, assumptions, you know, uh, if, you know, we're talking about a way to deal with um, immigration that, that, um, you know, is, punitive for um, for immigrants, you know, it, it sounds like. Um, so your position is an illegal alien that comes over here, is a drunk driver, you know, and kills there, somebody well, so me, to be able to just say, stay here. There are, there are laws that already address that. And, you know, I don't think that there's a need to enhance those penalties because there are already pretty severe penalties for that. So, you know, I, I look, so, you know, my grandfather, when he came to the United States in 1924, you know, it was during the, the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. So he was actually not authorized to be here. But, you know, he was law abiding in, in all other respects and, uh, you know, worked and, and contributed to the economy of this country. And, you know, 40 years later, he was able to adjust his status and, and become a citizen and allow for the sponsorship of my parents to come in the late 60s and then for, for me to be born here in the U.S. and eventually get elected to public office. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, representing a district that is majority immigrant and, you know, I don't know what percentage are undocumented. Um, but, you know, I treat them as my constituents like everyone else. And I think that, you know, folks, um, you know, should have access to opportunities to, you know, raise their families. You know, if they're already here, um, you know, there might be some that, uh, you know, break the law. And there are laws that are in place to address uh, those folks, you know, um, they're, you know, they're are deportations that occur every day. And, um, you know, those who have broken the law are, are you know, the ones that, um, you know, are in line for that. But, you know, I, I generally, you know, do not agree that we need to have harsher um, penalties in place just because somebody is undocumented. Um, as a corollary to the same question, as, as, a, as a corollary, as a corollary. To, all right, I'm going to try one more time. As a corollary to the same question, um, what do you think would need to be solved? I mean, you know, the, my, my whole re rationale is the reason why we have so many undocumented people is that we haven't had comprehensive immigration reform on the Democrats or the Republicans. Do you want to comment on that real quick or not? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that um, the system that exists right now is a broken system. And if we did have comprehensive immigration reform, um, I think that that would make life easier for a lot of folks who, you know, are here just to to have better opportunities and to raise their families and, you know, and they are contributing to our society and economy. I really believe that. And so, you know, I, I just don't agree with um, undocumented immigrants being continued to be scapegoated because, you know, there are a lot of problems in our society, but, you know, they're not to blame for them. All right, Charlie, you're next on the question. Then we'll go to Margaret Gillette and then Margaret and Frank. All right, Charlie, you're next. Yeah. Yes, Representative. Public transit 
had suffered uh, drastically in reduced ridership during the pandemic and they're struggling financially to recover. Um, and there are certain gaps like in your district, there are very few if any 24 hour service, any bus routes. Um, and Archer 62 service, the main, main thoroughfare uh, service has deteriorated precipitously. Is there any priority given by you or the General Assembly on seeing public transit through this crisis to recovery? Yes, I, I would like to work on um, ways to increase ridership for um, public transit. And I do have a bill that I'm planning to um, refile. This is something that um, I tried to pass a few years back. Um, maybe it was my first or, or second year. I'm not sure. Um, but, um, you know, there's a, a federally available pre-tax program, you know, where um, companies can offer um, a pre-tax benefit if you were to uh, pur purchase your, your transit card. So, you know, this is very much like um, the the pre-tax healthcare um, uh, program that that you know many people take advantage of. So you know this is a program that exists, but very few people take part in it because they don't know it exists, and um, a lot of companies don't offer it. And so I had a bill that required um, companies to include that in their menu of benefits. You know, so people can. Um, opt in to, to pay for their their transit fares um, up front and, and have it be a part of their pre-tax um, benefits. Um, so they would you know save money on taxes but but you know also um, you know be encouraged to to use public transportation you know buy the, these um, monthly fares for for Metro or CTA um, or you know whatever other, part of the, the state um, they may be in, um, you know, because there's there's more of an opportunity to take advantage of this, um, this um, federally available program if companies were required to offer it um, as part of their benefits package. Um, so that was, you know, one idea that um, I thought this would be a good time to re reintroduce it, um, you know, in in the next session, so that we can assist with um, um, uh, public transportation ridership. Um, and then I'm also interested in um, uh, having Illinois enter, or or maybe the city of Chicago. I'm not sure. Um, enter into these discussions about what it would take to um, make public transportation free. Yeah, you know, yes. maybe starting with, uh, I mean, you know, there have been colleagues who have proposed legislation to make it free for students, and I support that. But um, you know, why not free for everyone? Because um, the portion of the budget for, for CTA and, and Metra probably um, doesn't truly depend on um, what comes in through the fare box. I mean, there are already um, state and federal um, subsidies that make up the bulk of the budget. And so, you know, what, what would it take to, um, you know, to to make trans public transportation free, right? Like how much would it cost the state to, you know, increase the portion that would be, um, that would not come in through the fare box. So, and so, you know, I'm interested in doing some of that research and, and you know, seeing if there is a path to, to doing that. I heard a, a really informative program um, uh, recently where, uh, the mayor of Boston was talking about that, and and you know there were other uh, policymakers that focus on public transportation that you know explained how you know it is actually um, 
you know, more feasible than we might think because um, the fair box portion of the revenue isn't that large a percentage of the overall budget for um, for the the public transit system. So you know, I think that's worth investigating, and and you know, I'm really quite interested in. Thank um, you. In okay. that. Yeah. All right, Thank Margaret. You very much. Margaret, you're next. Go ahead, please. So a quick Mar question. Margaret Gillette, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're in a very uh, venomous uh, election campaign, and I'm in Texas, and many ugly comments are made about not undocumented people, people without papers. I'd like to know if any studies ever been done <clears throat> on the percentage of uh, people without papers who commit crimes versus the percentage of people with papers who commit crimes. I think there have already been studies done and it is a very small percentage. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, the reason we've been able to pass a lot of immigrant friendly legislation in Illinois, you know, for example, um, you know, several years ago, maybe seven years ago, we passed legislation to create um, a uh, temporary visitor driver's license. And that's a driver's yeah. license that would allow somebody who's undocumented to uh, legally drive a car. And yeah. because the reason was that, um, you know, if we're, if we provide the driver's license and the safety uh, requirements attached to them, it actually makes our roads safer. Yeah. And that those who can access, um, you know, who would like to access that category of driver's license would also have to um, buy insurance like everybody else. <clears throat> and so, you know, that's something that, that we've done in Illinois, um, you know, I think that it was based on studies showing that, you know, the average person who is undocumented and wants to drive a car, they're going to do it anyway because they need to get to work and take their kids to school. But, you know, we had an opportunity to regulate that and make it safer for everybody else because in getting that license, they would have to sure. follow safety procedures <laughs> and purchase car insurance. No, that's very important. See, most of this these attitudes are punitive toward people of color. Well, we want them to come here and do our dirty work, but then we don't want them here. <laughs> so your your comments are very helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right, Margaret uh, Aguilar, please, you're next, so go ahead. Yeah, um, in, in an ideal world where whatever, what kind of plan would you support or have you thought about, or maybe somebody else has thought about that would, um, I'm sorry, my bread is done, <laughs> um, it, to um, uh, reform immigration. You know, what would be your main points in reforming Im immigration and making it a, a, an equitable, just, um, maybe even compassionate <laughs> system? And what, what do you think? What, what would you do? Right. So, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, that's something that has to happen at the federal level. But at the same time, you know, I have been a proponent of comprehensive immigration reform for, for many years. Um, you know, I can't remember the, the number of millions of, of people who are undocumented in the country currently. Um, and, you know, during the Obama administration, you know, we tried to, um, you know, chip away at that by, you know, providing um, um, deferred action for um, the child uh, for childhood arrivals, right? So these are, you know, what are sometimes called the dreamers, children who were brought here by their parents, and you know, for the most part, grew up here, and you know, they're, you know, illegal through no fault of their own. And so, you know, the, there are millions of, of people under that status and under um, President Obama, he was able to create this DACA program through executive order. But, you know, that's been challenged in the courts, you know, it wasn't created um, through Congress. And, um, 
and I think that the program is about to expire. Um, and so, you know, that adds to the reason why we need some kind of comprehensive legislation that would, you know, start with dreamers, but then also, also include their parents because, um, you know, I, I just don't believe that there needs to be a punitive um, approach to this. It does nobody any good. You know, my first chief of staff uh, was a dreamer and, you know, she, uh, and and you know a number of my um, my office staff you know either are from mixed status families you know so meaning that you know they're citizens but their parents um, might be undocumented um, you know it it just makes it very difficult uh, for these families because you know there's there's fear of of you know families being ripped apart or you know if um you know if somebody is um is uh, you know discovered to be undocumented so you know there, there's a, a just a really traumatic um potential impact that that you know this situation can have on on many of these families who are you know, working and paying taxes for the most part. So, you know, they're here and they're mostly law abiding. And so I think that we need to figure out a way to allow them to stay here and normalize their status um, so they can go on with their lives. Because, um, you know, like I said, in my own family history, you know, my grandfather was not supposed to be here you know and it was because there were laws on the books that were discriminatory towards chinese immigrants and um you know yet he came you know he had no choice because he couldn't make a living back in china and so he had to come here and and find a way to um earn money and and send it back home but the result was you know he was separated from his family for 40 years you know and uh um, you know, had there not been a way for him to um, change his status and become a citizen, I wouldn't be here today. My parents wouldn't be here. And so, you know, I think that there are, um, you know, lots of, of contributions that immigrants make to this country and they, those contributions need to be acknowledged and, um, and their contribution to the economy needs to be acknowledged. Um, you know, it, it, I think that, you know, there are a lot of people who continue to blame immigrants for, um, you know, whatever ills they're experiencing or seeing in, in society. And I just don't think that that's, um, you know, justifiable it's um you know it's it's a, a way to um keep people uh separated and and you know at each other's throats rather than working together you know to um you know make things more equal for everyone okay now that there's nobody else asking questions i'd like to know Teresa, what you think about um I'm right now doing a deep dive into Dinesh D'Souza's book, 2000 Mules. And uh, I've also delved into other sources like the, uh, you know, lostnotstolen.org, the one written by Republicans. I'm just trying to understand um, the status of our elections, particularly voter access in Illinois and what you're doing or what people are doing to ensure voter access and uh, what you might, what your views are on it. So over the years, I have worked on uh, voter access and um, we, I think over the past 10 years, you know, we've taken a number of measures to make the ballot, um, you know, make voting more accessible to people. And so, you know, for example, um, we have same day registration, we have um, absentee ballots, you don't have to come with come up with a reason, you know, so we have vote by mail. Um, you know, uh, we've expanded the um, period, the early voting period, 
Um, and uh, during the pandemic, we, um, you know, we have drop boxes and, and um, you know, a way for folks to apply for vote by mail ballots and to, you know, keep that on record so that they will continue to vote in that fashion. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of things that we did in Illinois, and um, I think that it's important, uh, you know, the, the Voting Rights Act exists for a reason, and I don't think that, um, you know, it should be um, uh, diminished or done away with. Um, I think that, you know, our, our right to vote, it should be sacrosanct, and that, you um, you know, if, if, you know, you've studied our nation's history, you know, which I have, right, I have a PhD in history. Um, you know, there were all kinds of measures um, after um, emancipation that were designed to keep um, Black people from, from voting. You know, there were, um, you know, uh, tests that folks had to take, you know, there were all kinds of, uh, you know, crazy means to, to disenfranchise an entire population. And so, you know, the reason that we have um, the Federal Voting Rights Act, and then, you know, 10 years ago, we passed the, the Illinois Voting Rights Act, you know, we need to continue to preserve um, the franchise and protect the right to vote. Um, you know, as the child of immigrants and somebody who represents an immigrant community, I think that it's even more important because, you know, there's language access issues, you know, just because you're not fluent in English, if you're a citizen, you should have the right to vote. And so, you know, over the years, you know, we have, um, you know, created um, ballots, made sure that they're available. Um, voting information is available in different languages, um, you know, and that's according to, um, you know, one of the provisions of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, you know, those have been important um, issues for me. And, and, you know, I would even go as far as, um, you know, so I supported um, um, vote by mail or, you know, um, uh, voting opportunities for folks who, you know, are in jail, you know, in detention waiting for um, their trials. Um, I'm proud that Illinois is one of those states where, you know, once you're, you know, no longer in prison, you have your right to vote back, you know, that's your franchise is restored. Um, other states, you know, take that away um, for the rest of your life, just because you were incarcerated at one time. Um, so, you know, there's also a, a, a movement, um, you know, some um, advocacy organizations are working on, um, you know, uh, restoring the right to vote for people who even who are in prisons currently. And, you know, and I'm open to that. So, you know, I, I think that it's, it's a shame that in other states um, they're, you know, taking away <laughs> the right to vote and making it harder for folks to vote. Um, you know, the there has been research showing that the claims of voter fraud are are greatly exaggerated, and and you know the, the that's the justification that's been used to um, limit. Um, um, voting by mail or absentee ballots and, and um, you know, just making it harder in general. And, and I don't think that's right. I, I think that, uh, you know, we need to do what we can to ensure that, um, you know, people have their right to vote and that it's not made more difficult for them. Right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your thanks. Okay, Charlie, I'm going to let you go next. Um, I'm putting in the chat that I Nature's calling me for just a brief minute, so I shall be right back. But Charlie, uh, please go ahead and uh, ask your question. I'll be listening in the background while you uh, engage in the uh, comprehensive dialogue with State Rep. Theresa. I shall be back in short order. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, 
Representative, my, my loony, I have a loony neighbor who has a stockpile of weapons and he envisions himself per the Constitution, misinterpretation of the Constitution, that he's some sort of uh, guardian or law enforcement personnel. Uh, are you in favor? In my window, I have a sign that said, that says we need common sense gun control, gun laws. Uh, can I count on you to support my campaign to make Bridgeport a gun-free community? Absolutely, Charles. Um, I think I've seen that sign in your window. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big issue. Um, these days and you know we we've had some good shootings on 31st street and other areas yeah uh, i mean you know the mass shootings that we've seen and and the everyday uh gun violence that that we experience you know in in our neighborhoods um you know uh, right around here right i mean uh, i i I, I agree with you that uh, there's been a lot of misinterpretation of the Second Amendment, um, and yeah, we need we need some um, we need some stricter gun laws. If I post that, if I post anything on the neighborhood Facebook page advocating gun control, as Chuck the senior, I get all sorts of hostile remarks. So it seems to be the gun community is rather belligerent at times. <laughs> they tell yeah. me to get out of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we've we've had some horrible tragedies that um, point to this need, especially um, banning assault weapons. I mean, I think that that's something that um, my colleagues have um, recently, uh, you know, refiled their legislation on. And, and uh, so I, I think that um, in veto session or um, lame duck session, or maybe in next year's session, we'll, we'll be taking up some of these um, um, proposals. And I think there's a need, okay. so, you know, I'd be for it. I, I've already signed on as a um, co-sponsor of the, uh, my colleague's bill to ban assault weapons. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jacob, are you able to unmute? Jake. Hello. For Jacob. Yeah, go yes. ahead. So where you are uh, in your area there, um, do you have ranked trust voting? We don't. What's blocking it? Um, so, I think that um, there's an a, there's an entrenched uh, system um, that um, you know prefers the the status quo because it's more predictable and they know how the system works and and um, I think you know for most people uh, from you know among my colleagues my guess is that um, you know, it, it takes a lot of um, predictability out of elections and, um, you know, they're not necessarily for a system that they don't know very much about. So that's that's my guess. Um, but I've I've seen that. Um, that's why know, we have to like, replace these Democrats. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, not, I'm a Democrat, but, uh, you know, I I've are seen, you for ranked choice I, voting? I, I would be. Yeah. You know, I've seen um, not would be. Are you fighting for it? I don't currently have. This is uh, critical. Ranked uh, choice voting not, is critical uh, to make sure that only the most loving, the most wise enter into the seats of public service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this so is critical my, my, because you wouldn't believe how many elections I've attended where people. No, go, you, you oh, can. You know, I really sir, you can comment later in the rebuttal period. You have a whole yeah. thing you can. So, comment. so I'll say that. So I, about you know, choice I mentioned voting. earlier that I was uh, that I grew up in California, in in Why San don't you Francisco. Let me finish? I was trying to make a point. It was going to take what, 15 seconds? 
You can make a point in the rebuttal. This is the question and answer no, this period, is... sir. Well, I'm trying to get clarification here. What's going on? Like, why isn't she fighting for it? Hmm? Why? I have... you want to fit in with your colleagues there? The Democratic establishment people? Why? So tell me why. There currently isn't a proposal, and I. I so why know, haven't you done it? I I haven't um, I haven't this gotten is critical. It. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> sure. I, I mean I I don't disagree. I I have seen places where it's been put in place, including my original hometown, and I've seen it work there. And yeah, I I have fought for it in the past. Um, you know, as a board member of um, Common Cause Illinois, you know, there was an effort to uh, bring that proposal to the city council, and I was involved in that effort. Um, but in the legislature, you know, there are 118 members of the House and 59 members of the state Senate. So, you know, it Usually, you know, you don't uh, put forth proposals without doing the research and the legwork to make sure that you have a majority of your colleagues that can sign on. No, so you can you use know, your position, saying, uh, uh, the bully pulpit, even though you know you might lose, you don't have the votes, you have to get it out there. You have to get it, you have to create momentum where there is no momentum. You don't wait for the momentum to come first. You have to create it, use your position your voice to make it happen, right? Sure. Okay, uh, uh, anyone else got questions here? If not, I have one. Uh, Illinois is very- Charlie, evenly... uh, Charlie, Margaret's next. She's got her hand raised. Oh, and then... all right, Margaret, I'm sorry. It's all right, ahead, Margaret. I didn't see it. It, it's, it's all right, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll ask a question. What do you think would be the most important point in a reform uh, legislation for, to reform immigration? What do you think should be the, the primary push to reform? What area would you look at? I mean, DACA, I think only applies to some people. And, you know, the, uh, they tried to make it so that if you served in the military, you could get citizenship. And I don't think that worked very well. Um, uh, or it didn't work at all. I don't. I don't. I don't know how that worked, but it it didn't work for some people. Uh, my husband knew somebody who served in the Korean War for three years and was really you got met medals and everything else, but he wasn't a citizen, and they wouldn't give him citizenship, and he didn't know how to anyway. Um, um, the whole so, point. So is, having some, some kind of pathway for yeah. What what is the most important thing that you think could reform? immigration the most the way we should look at focusing our energies um so like i said that's that's something that um is addressed at the federal level so congress i think um you know might be in a position this coming uh this coming session or this coming year um to take that up and so I, you know, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but my hope is that it includes a pathway to citizenship for, um, you know, undocumented people who are here in this country currently. Um, so beyond just the DACA uh, uh, recipients, you know, th their parents as well. Um, you know, so those who are currently in this country and, um, you know, my understanding is that uh, there are discussions about how to move that forward. Um, you know, there's, I think there's a need for maybe 10 uh, Republicans to sign on, you know, to, to vote with the Democrats and um, there are discussions right now with uh, with them and and they're up to you know getting four of them on board uh from what i understand um but you know our i think our how we can help with that of course is is um 
you know, just spreading the word and, and you know, trying to, uh, you know, talk to more people from, um, you know, across the aisle to, to get them there. But, you know, we, so we live in a state that um, is, is taking the lead on that, you know, with um, Senator Durbin and, um, and uh, Congressman Chuy Garcia, who's my um, member of Congress. So, you know, I would you know, get updates from them and, and, you know, see where they are on the effort and, and uh, find out what they need. Um, you know, that's, you know, whatever they decide to do, I obviously fully support them, um, you know, but I have less control over, um, you know, the Republican members that are in other states. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe whoever, you know, whatever Republican members gets elected to Congress from Illinois, you know, maybe they can be convinced as well. But I, you know, I don't know. Right. I have uh, one more, a couple more questions for you now that nobody's asked. What's first off? The first one is, uh, what is the hardest thing you've done, or the hardest thing you've tried to do as a state representative? Well, it was pretty hard to get elected. <laughs> I'll start okay. there. Um, right. you know, since I, as I mentioned before, I ran against the son of a, a twenty-year incumbent, and uh, um, you know, had to, uh, you know, bring my all to that campaign. But you know, it's already been seven years, and so um, the hardest thing that that I've ever done. Uh, you would explode. You would yell over. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, you know, sometimes it's not even difficult bills that are hard to pass. I'll tell you a story about um, you know what happened in uh, 2018 when former Senator um, Sandoval, Marty Sandoval, um, wanted me to support his daughter for a county board. And I refused to do that. I supported her opponent. And when I got back to Springfield after the spring, uh, after the election, you know, the primary in, in um, I think it was March that year, um, you know, he retaliated by trying to kill all my bills, including um, a bill that I had passed, um, you know, with a bipartisan majority in the House um, that was meant to address bicycle safety. And so, you know, the bill, um, it's called the Dutch Reach Bill, it put the Dutch Reach method of opening car doors um, into the rules of the road um, in Illinois and, and added a um, an exam question on it, and and the Dutch what the Dutch reaches is, is that um, you know when you parked your car, you reach over with your right hand uh, to open the door so that you look behind you and oh. and don't uh, door a cyclist. Um, you know, so it's meant to save lives, and it got uh, bipartisan support. I um, passed it in the House pretty easily, but. You know, it was supposed to go to the Senate after the the primary, and uh, Senator Marty Sandoval, you know, who's now deceased, um, at the time, you know, he was pretty angry at me for um, not supporting his daughter, <laughs> and so you know, he he tried to kill all my bills, including that one, and I ended up having to um, get a shell bill refile it, pass it again in the House, and then try to get it into a different committee in the Senate. Um, and, you know, he used all kinds of means to try to kill the bill. I ended up ultimately passing it, but, you know, it's it wasn't even um, anything that was controversial. It just got, um, you know, stuck in this situation where, you know, this bully, um, who wanted me to support his daughter was retaliating against me. Do you so, find out? Okay. I was just curious. That, that, that I didn't think that uh, 
legislatures could resort to that kind of uh, low life uh, conduct, if you know what I'm saying. But that's very interesting. And uh, real quick, I think it's you're a Sox fan, right? Okay. And what do you think about the Bears relocating to, to Arlington Heights? Yeah, I hate to see it. Um, I, you know, Soldier Field is is not far from from you know where we live, and um, and you know I think that having the Bears in the city of Chicago is really important for you know our city economy and and uh, you know bringing uh, tourists and fans and helping the e economic activity in this area. So, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, and I'm sure that um, the Bears franchise is gonna be able to, you know, get some um, tax dollars, you know, if not for the stadium itself, then for the structures around it, you know, the, the bars and restaurants and things like that. And, um, you know, I just hope that the, uh, the residents, you know, have a means to protect themselves, you know, have some claw back if, if they eventually decide to, to leave there and go somewhere else. Well, the thing is, I can tell you right now that that area they're going to is the old Arlington Park racetrack and it, they, they couldn't handle the traffic on game day. It just, it just, it would be a, a nightmare getting through there, even on game day when if the bears were starting to go in there. Yeah. Um, anyway, enough, enough said about that. Um, I'm gonna, okay, Bob, I know you got a question, so go ahead. Um, yeah, Teresa, uh, is there anything uh, you can do at the state level to to rein in uh, Kim Fox and make her start putting criminals in jail and keeping them there? Um, I, you know, her, she operates at the county level, so... Um, you know, we, we, that's not in our jurisdiction. So, yeah. Is there any uh, law that, that, uh, that, you know, obey her oath of office? Um, you, you know, so I think that um, she would say that she is doing her job and that, um, you know, if you look at the, um, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's, you know, there might be a lot of um, um, scare tactics about, you know, the rate at which she's letting folks out. I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily, um, you know, borne out with data. You know, this I mean, some she doesn't even go. Some don't don't even go to jail. Like that big shootout that was on the south side, and she said, "Well, there were uh, um, uh, mutual combatants, and nobody even went to jail, even for firing a firearm on a on a residential street." Remember that shootout? It was all it was it was a viral video. It was on the news. You know, car just pulls up in front of another house, and people get out and start blasting away on the porch, and people in the house are shooting back nobody nobody even got a ticket yeah it's unfortunate okay um all right any any other questions real quick i think what we'll do now is uh if, if you're willing to stick around teresa we'll uh go into our rebuttal period now and that means everybody get a certain set amount of time to uh say what's on their mind and uh, i'll give everybody about four minutes tonight so who is interested in doing a rebuttal tonight nobody okay charlie is one who else bob matter uh margaret and frank who else all right i'll start off with bob matter then margaret and frank and then charlie paydock and anybody else who wants to jump in i'll run a clock here for four minutes <laughs> Okay, I, I, can I just uh, turn off my camera for a bit because I haven't eaten dinner. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna reach right for a ahead. snack, just, and, just, but I'll listen. Okay. I'll be listening. Stay, okay. Uh, Teresa, please do. You noticed I turned off mine a couple of times too. So okay, uh, we'll.
will uh, maintain a four minute clock. Um, go ahead and we'll just start our rebuttals and you'll get the last word when you're ready, when we're done. We should First of all, let's thank our speaker, Tim. You're right. Let's thank our speaker, Charlie. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, I'll go five minutes since we don't have a lot of people on board right now. But uh, whenever you're ready, Bob, I'll start the clock and we'll give you five minutes if you don't mind. And uh, uh, go go ahead, Bob, and uh, let us know what you want to stay and uh, you're, you're good to go. So, Mr. Matter, go ahead and start. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, Margaret Grier was wondering what the uh, rates were uh, comparing, you know, citizens to non-citizens. And uh, that's kind of a, a nebulous thing uh, because a lot of states now, like, uh, like well, the blue states like uh, California and Oregon, uh, quit reporting, uh, quit the citizenship status of their inmates uh, years ago, like in 2013, and of course the, the fear that if because if if American voters, uh, look, you know, were aware of the crime that the uh, illegal aliens were causing, there would be a lot more clamoring to to close the border, which of course would uh, put the nicks on the Democratic plan to basically change the electorate, since they can't win over the hearts and minds of the white working class and the white middle class, they can replace them with voters who will. And that's exactly what this is all about. It's all about voters, you know, bringing in voters. And like Teresa Moss said, they're not, she doesn't like to call them illegal aliens. She likes to call them undocumented workers or what we, what we, what we say in, on the right, unregistered Democrats. Um, now, the other thing about the gun controls, I found it amusing that Teresa's biggest effort to combat uh, gu so-called gun violence is, is to uh, come down hard on assault weapons, which out of the 514 uh, people that were shot and killed in Chicago so far this year, only a sprinkling were shot with assault rifles uh there, there was just a few the 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 vast vast majority are people being shot with handguns and uh and a day now a dangerous uh, uh trend there though is that people are putting these automatic switches on their glocks to turn them into fully automatic machine guns and then they're getting uh these giant uh drum clips and extended magazines and uh, that is far more dangerous than any AR-15 ever is. Uh, but yet we don't hear a peep about that. Now, some of the statistics we do know about crime in Chicago is, th is that 81% of the homicides are uh, black victims and 15% are Hispanic. And so what we, what we and, and, and gun crimes, tend to be uh, the, the, the race of the offender and the victim tend to be the same, although that's not always the case. I mean, there certainly are a number of, a lot of white people that have been gunned down by uh, people of color as well. But um, what we really have here is a, a black and brown violence problem and not really a gun violence problem. And if you look at uh, Indiana, for instance, who our gun laws are quite lax compared to Illinois. Uh, Illinois has a higher uh, homicide rate than than we do, and even though we have much laxer gun laws, we have constitutional carry. We don't have waiting periods. We you know we can buy as many guns as we want. We don't have to have a FOID card or any you know anything like that. Uh, and yet our our homicide rate is is a couple two or three percent lower than illinois illinois is something like nine point something percent and indiana's is uh seven point something percent not or seven out of you know a hundred thousand something like that i believe i don't have uh 
uh, time to go dig up the, the web page, but that, that's all on the web that's out there. Um, and I guess I will rein it in there. Maybe we can come back for a double dip later. Okay. Uh, all right. Then, uh, I'm going to let uh, Margaret Aguilar go next. So, Margaret, when you're ready, I'll give you five minutes. God, please, please don't give me five minutes. Anyway, um, I just want to thank uh, Representative Ma for her presentation, and I'm really sorry that I was late. But um, and and I appreciate her position on a lot of things. I, you know, I um, am a, a firm supporter of public education, and she certainly is seems to be that way too. Um, I, I'm a firm supporter of um, immigration, uh, immigration reform and hope that we're, we'll be able to clean up this mess because it's really appalling and there's all kinds of injustices and, and horrible things happening to families and to people because of, of the immigration um, laws and the system that's in them. I know personally families who've been broken up when somebody was deported and you know, it was just, it was really awful anyway. So um, I, and, you know, this anti-immigration thing is something that's uh, a couple of hundred years old. It's, you can go back to the 1850s and find the same kind of rhetoric against immigrants, against immigrants to begin with. And um, it was a lot harder to be a quote, illegal immigrant then. Um, so at any rate, um, and so I, and then also there's a whole lot of, of, of horrible things against people who are actually legal immigrants who are coming here as refugees, but who are denied to even come in the country and put in unsafe situations after they have fled just appalling circumstances with the clothes on their back and they're carrying their kids and walking for for hundreds of miles often or a thousand miles or whatever. And then they're denied at the border. They are legal under our law and under international law. They are legal and they are able, they, they are legally can claim refugee status and they legally should be admitted until they're until they get court dates. But we have all this political bullshit and they're used for political purposes. And it's just like it was 100, 150 years ago. They were used for political purposes to, uh, because the white birth rate was down, we didn't want all of those people of color like Irish and Italians to immigrate here. You know, what? It's just copious bullshit. Anyway, so, but I really appreciate her uh, thing on, um, on immigration. The other thing that I was a little bit disturbed by was um, Bob uh, being somewhat disrespectful to her and, um, you know, just this subtext of um, disdain because of her political opinions and um and really disrespect there was just a subtext to that he's real careful about it but you know when he calls her by her first name i mean please so anyway he doesn't even know her why does he say teresa she's not his representative and even if she was that's not appropriate of course i'm old school about that i call people mr whatever mrs whatever all of my patients were like that, even if they were younger than me. They were always Mrs. Smith and Mr. Jones. I didn't do that. Every, pe other people would call people by that, but I never did that. Never did that. Anyway, so that's just my automatic fall to position. So um, that I, uh, I just, I, I, uh, there's a lot of things that need to happen for this all to be resolved and for, for, for this all to be more just, more equitable, more reasonable, more compassionate society. There's a lot of things that need to happen. And uh, the Republicans are not part of that. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you, Margaret. Um, Jacob, you got your hand up. I'm going to put you in before Charlie, so I'll give you five minutes if you want to unmute yourself and uh, take your time to uh, participate in this, Jacob. So you're next if you're ready. Go ahead, Jacob. You got five minutes to uh, speak your mind. Okay, Jacob, yes. go ahead. Sorry, Mike wasn't working there. Okay, is it All working right, I'll start okay, now? Okay, good. So um, this is to the representative. I'd like to know uh, what she is doing to get all private money out of politics, all private money out of politics. She told us she's not working towards ranked choice voting. Uh, second, secondly, uh, what is she doing to outlaw all PACs, political action committees, including APAC? And thirdly, what is she doing to shift money away from the military industrial complex to research and development of fusion energy? Sure. Is that all you wanted to say, Jacob? Yeah, I want to yeah, know what. Um, Hurry, Teresa, well, we'll I feel the up. major problem you got, in you our got country is, uh, and, uh, is citizen um, apathy. And we have to uh, get, especially the young people, to come out to become well informed, firstly, firstly, for all people to be well informed on all the major issues of today. And this requires that we have that we have knowledge of where to turn to, to get our information. Because right now we have no fourth estate in this country. The fourth estate is under the dominance, the thumb of the plutocracy. So we have to turn to, and we have to find out who are the independent um, truth seeking and, and reliable journalists out there full time that are working on our behalf to find out what are the facts, what is the evidence, which is very time consuming and present them to the American people so, so that we are well informed before we make any decision, any choice, any action. So, um, and we have to galvanize, we have to excite. This is the work I do to get the young people to participate, to get them involved in the political campaigns, to run for office, uh, and, uh, and at the very least, at the very least, be well informed and show up on the, on, you know, to vote. That's the, that's the least anyone can do. And if, if every, if only 80% of us, if only 80% did that, it would be a game changer. It would, it would totally change the landscape of, uh, the United States, the political process. It would, it, it would transform the Congress uh and just that one little thing be well informed that means making sure you're turning to good sources reliable trustworthy sources of information from reliable journalists ethical moral journalists right who have a long track record history of showing they are lovers of the truth right turning to those people becoming well informed and then showing up to vote Okay, uh, is that it? Is that it, uh, Jacob? Well, I guess for now. Okay. All right. Uh, I noticed that uh, who else was going to go? All right. I'm going to put my uh, quick rebuttal in, and it's going to be basically, you know, saying first off, Teresa, I would like to. Uh, I'm sorry, Teresa Ma. I'd like to say thank you very much for presenting with us tonight. Um, I really appreciated your comments and you give me a little bit of inspiration to run for office myself. You make it look easy to a certain degree. I just don't know if I could put up with all the pettiness in, involved with some of this stuff, but it is very interesting to hear the process. About uh, Jacob, I know you're from New York. You know, we have here in Chicago something of a revolution going on in our news group, newsroom. Our public broadcasting station is owned by a company called Chicago Public Media, and they just bought out the newspaper called the Sun-Times. The PBS affiliate here in the city of Chicago, a WBEC, is probably one of the best, most informed source of, of independent and verifiable news around. I listen to them every morning. 
The Sun Times was just recently bought by them, and they're no longer an, a profit seeking institution. They do have to make money through ads and subscription rates, but they've also made their content available free on the web. You can you might have to sign in with an account with an email address, but that's all you need. So as far as um, you know, getting unbiased media sources that they're they're out there. You just got to do a little bit of digging. I know a lot of them are owned by like Fox and some of the other things, but even there too, you know, you can always go to a foreign source like France 24 or even the BBC or needless to say, sometimes you get the best coverage from press TV out of Iran, you know, which is a radical source. And I'm surprised. I have found that organizations are co-opt and uh, well, I focus on individuals, getting to know them, getting to see yeah, their I track records, understand, individuals. Understand. Get to know people, not organizations. Organizations can be taken I'm over. They saying. have a hidden hand. They do things behind closed doors that are secret and yeah. nobody knows about it. So I would stay as away. Far, I would recommend, based on my experience, staying away from any organization, corporation. As far as your recommendation for fusion power, it's a no brainer. It's not going to probably happen for another 20 years down the road. If you really want to see uh, well, at the rate we're going, because we're not going to spend so much money on killing you wanna, people. If, 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 you wanna sell the money. Some real, if you want to see some real innovation in the nuclear space, you'd look at the molten salt thorium. You could solve the fusion problem very quickly. Create uh, a Manhattan, Manhattan project like. Uh, you know, project a Manhattan. Um, oh. You know, when they did with the atom bomb, yeah, and you can easily you solve this. Bring all the scientists. I think. I think what we'll do is we'll finish here. Okay. The thing is, nothing will get done until all we right. get and elect the most loving, the most wise people to enter well, into the, the seats is, in public Jake, service. I, I do. I do. Nothing agree. will get done. We need I courageous, do, I, fearless people I that are not afraid to die. But you're going to really get rid of a, uh, a private money in politics. I'll just find another way to finance the candidates. I'm all no, for the public, we, we distribute the, the public uh, yeah, the tax payers okay, from like, the government, you know, okay. finances, gives a certain oh, yeah, amount of money, time free time about, to voice everything. Okay. So everybody gets an equal portion. That's how it works. We, we that makes the, sense. Jacob, you know, the thing is, I know we could probably move to some kind of system like the British do, or it's a very limited time period and everybody gets equal time in the media and some other things. No. But anyway, no. um, you know, I just don't know how you'd be able to do it. All right. And the, the last, British system is not working either. The last, the last thing I'd like to address in my own rebuttal part of this year is that, you know, there are always solutions to to problems. And uh, again, Teresa, thank you for coming tonight. Um, and I do know it was probably one of the hardest things you ever did winning an election. I helped um, another representative a few years ago. His <laughs> name was a congressman who was, uh, it was in 1994, I helped him elect our uh He's now retired, but he was also in office. I'm forgetting his name right off the top of my head. I don't know why, but I spent about 30 hours on his campaign helping him get elected. And recently, um, I did, you know, do a little work with a representative out in Addison, Illinois, who was running for state senate, who had some, who uh, also is, she's now passed away as well. But, you know, getting getting some video work done for her to help out, you know, a little bit with the Republican Party here in McHenry County. So I do know it's a very uh, hard thing to do to pay, run, win an election sometimes. So anyway, again, congratulations. Um, I do see that there's a lot of solutions to what's up there. And thank you guys very much for letting me go. All right, uh, Charlie, I guess you're going to be up next because you always like going last. So uh, you're up and uh, let's give you the five minutes you deserve. So go ahead, Charlie. All right, first of all, let me as well. Thank Representative Teresa Ma for uh, taking our best shots, uh, which I thought she adequately handled. Uh, and uh, hope you have many more continued successful campaigns and are able to con continue uh, with your efforts towards providing public service on the legislative arena. My primary focus is at the federal level. I don't I do some state activity, but I appreciate learning what's going on in the General Assembly. I will be eclectic as usual. I will cover four specific areas. Number one, I, I alone worked assiduously to get free public transit for seniors, only to see it taken away uh, a year or two later. 
um, I believe it should be established. Transit fare is a regressive tax on the poor. Uh, seniors should get it because they use public transit during off-peak periods in which the transit systems exist for the rush hour, primarily and always. And seniors use it during, uh, during the middle of the day or on weekends when the transit system effectively is already paid for by the ridership uh, during the peak periods. So it truly does not generate much, if any, in the way of revenue. We get complaints about CTA and other metro and so forth operating vehicles with very few riders. And they come up with a method of putting riders on those vehicles and they don't support it. Uh, the public hearings, the budget hearings for Metro Pace and CTA are coming up shortly. We're reviewing the three budgets and citizens taking action for public transit. We are reviewing the budgets right now and preparing our testimony. I highly recommend if you do not testify, you at least take a look at the budgets, glance through it. Uh, it can be rather onerous, 200 some pages, but you get an insight and an education into the realm of public transit. Um, the, uh, it's true, free public transit is, is, is being in, uh, adopted in many other communities and it has in the past. Number two, uh, okay, I already spoke on seniors being, uh, I'm identifying the neighborhood as Chuck the senior and anything you can do for free stuff for seniors, hey, I'm all for it. We, we worked hard to create this civilization such as it is. And in our declining years, we should be able, should not have economic discomfort in any fashion. <laughs> um, number three, hey, what's wrong with that? Number three, <laughs> okay, funny, this sounds pretty good. Um, there's no such thing as an illegal immigrant. Um, People, no one is illegal, and that's 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 uh, uh, that's killing the messenger kind of talk uh, that they have status here. People are coming here only to provide on their own, and providing for your own is not a criminal activity. They're looking to provide for their families, and uh, I operate a Lithuanian underground. My sister and I have several apartments and we rent all these Lithuanian immigrants. I don't inquire if they're legal or illegal. They all had over the years and I continue to do so. I'm welcoming another family and they are all very well behaved. As a matter of fact, the only problem I had and today I had an issue, an eviction notice to a white European male. So as far as I'm concerned, the immigrants are way better tenants than the indigenous population of the United States who Bob Matter thinks are like perfectly behaved saintly figures. That's an absurdity. Um, the, oh, we listen. And the other thing is, this is one part of the city that historically has been uh, a welcoming center, back of the yards, uh, for new arrivals to the United States. If there's any part of the world this is in particular, this is one location where historically it's been populated by, by immigrants. And we are not, we're all law abiding. I don't know what Bob's talking about. That's discoloration, which is not merited uh, by its uh, regard. Um, and last of all, if there's any problem with guns in the city, it is due to the fact that guns get arrive here from places like Indiana, where anything goes. There's no regulation of the weapons industry. So they create the problem. And that's why we need federal legislation. I don't think the General Assembly is entirely able to do that. They cannot legislate cross borders. But unless we have the neighboring states 
of Illinois conduct themselves responsibly regarding the control of weapons, we will never have achieved peaceful communities. Anyhow, I thank you very much. Again, welcome. please come again and give it a break and report back with us again sometime. Thank you. Okay, Tim. All right, uh, Teresa, you've got the floor for as long as you want to uh, rebut the rebutters or just say goodbye or whatnot. We appreciate you coming again tonight. So you get the last word. Okay, well, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Charles, for inviting me. I really enjoyed uh, having this opportunity to uh, talk with all of you tonight. And, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of really um, important topics and uh, many of which are very dear to my heart. And um, I really appreciated the exchange. And, um, and you know, just once again, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of do a little summary to, you know, touch on many of these uh, topics and, and also, you know, reiterate um, a little bit about, you know, who I am and what I stand for and, and, you know, therefore where I stand on many of these topics. And so, um, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm proud to um, be a member of the Illinois General Assembly, you know, where I consider myself a public servant, you know, I do this job full time. Um, and, you know, even though that's not required or, um, you know, the, the compensation for it is not commensurate with a full-time job necessarily. It's it's something that I, I believe in because, um, you know, I have constituents that I think deserve the attention and deserve, um, you know, somebody who's going to really devote all their time to um, making their lives better, right? That's why I ran for office in the first place, to improve people's lives. And, you know, I find it to be a rewarding job because I have this opportunity to make a difference and, and um, you know, make people's lives easier, um, you know, through the, the work that I do um, in the General Assembly. And um, it's also a really good time to uh, to be in public office in Illinois, because I think that we are moving away from the, the corrupt patronage systems that um, um, were extremely prevalent in the past in, in, in our state. Um, you know, it's been two years um, since um, the election of a new speaker over the one that um, you know had been um, in office for over 30 years and and you know controlled a lot of things um, you know in our state government uh, in, in the legislature and um, I've seen firsthand the quality of my colleagues improve um, you know with the the election of folks who are uh, more progressive and um, um, better educated and, you know, uh, more willing to work hard for their constituents. And, you know, with my election, you know, I, I defeated uh, somebody who was part of the, the Madigan machine, you know, somebody who had been in office for, for 20 years. Um, and then very, uh, you know, soon after, there were neighboring districts, you know, such as um, my colleague Aaron Ortiz's district, where you know he defeated the the brother of Ed Burke. He defeated Dan Burke, who had been in office for for thirty years. Um, you know, all part of this corrupt system that um, was based on patronage and and self dealing, and you know, folks who were in it for themselves rather than serving the people that they were elected to to serve and help um, you know so myself along with um, you know more than a dozen of my colleagues you know we're members of the progressive caucus I'm one of the three co-chairs of the progressive caucus in Illinois and you know all of us are really concerned about 
what we need to do to increase opportunity and uh, you know make things more um, fair and equitable and to uh, break down uh, barriers that, that you know keep people from um, opportunities and and um, education and and um, rights that that you know they they deserve and so you know I'm proud to be um, an active member of that caucus uh, you know we um, support measures that you know have been mentioned you know like public financing of of elections and and um, you know and ranked choice voting I, you know even though i am not currently uh carrying such a bill um i would be i would be supportive of, of a viable measure that that came um to to the legislature um but you know just on that note it's interesting um to note you know since um, you know, Jacobs from New York that um, the the New York City Council, I, I believe, um, uh, has a system of um, public financing. Um, yet uh, the most recent mayor that was elected seems to be like a little bit uh, on the corrupt side. Um, but uh, that that's just an, an aside. Um, in any case, I you know I also agree with you know what uh, what you said Jacob about you know reinforcing the fourth estate and making sure that uh, students have access to um, you know unbiased information um, you know I I and and following up on you know somebody who commented after that um, you know we, we've seen in Illinois um, you know our newspapers being taken over by these huge um, conglomerates that that you know are uh, not necessarily um, working in the interest of of you know the local uh, communities and and you know they're that are um, you know owned by hedge funds and you know so the fact that you know one of our uh, daily papers became part of um, the public media um, system and is is now um, you know free to access I think that's a good development but I have been troubled by the fact that young people do not make it a habit of, of reading newspapers and you know they get a lot of their news through um, social media um, you know which sometimes functions as an echo chamber and and um, proliferates a lot of really bad information so you know I agree that that's something that that needs to be addressed and and you know we need to um, ensure that that young people have access to quality civics education and they understand how to um, get involved in their um, in the electoral process and how to do research on on candidates and and help to elect people who really care about their communities and are willing to um, you know, give them a voice right so that's something that that i try to um, do by um talking to a, a lot of young people um but also sponsoring internship programs so that they get experience working in my office and seeing what um a public servant actually does um but um you know they're um, it's an ongoing issue and it's an ongoing struggle and I think that you know we we all need to be more cognizant about um, you know making sure that um, that uh, you know information is uh, free flowing and um, and uh, vetted and, and you know um, available accessible to to people um, and uh, following up on some of the the points that that Charles brought up, um, you know, I, it, you know, it's it's great having you as a constituent <laughs> because you know you uh, are uh, concerned about and working on all these same issues that that I care about as well. Um, you know, I have uh, a larger proportion of seniors in my district than than many of my colleagues, and so I make sure that. Um, that uh, I address issues that, that uh, older adults and, and seniors um, 
find important and um, public transportation definitely as I mentioned you know in my presentation is you know something I care about and I think that that comes from gr growing up as um, an immigrant in an immigrant family in a city you know like I said I grew up in San Francisco and um, you know so I grew up using public transportation and taking advantage of um, all the public amenities that were available to um, working families right so you know the park the um, our, our public transportation system libraries um, you know those are all assets that I think are important to um, protect and make accessible and available to um, you know folks that um, that you know may not have a lot of resources and and um, you know rely on these public amenities to um, to learn and and develop and and um, you know enjoy their lives um, you know in our cities um, so um, let's see what else a couple of uh, other points that that uh, that you brought up um, that I I want to um, touch on um gun violence so you know even though i did talk about uh, supporting measures to ban assault weapons you know one of the things that we've been doing at the state level is um investing a lot more money into violence prevention programs as a way to um to bring down the levels of violence um you know we since we recently um, legalized uh, recreational cannabis. Um, one of the um, one of the programs that we included in that uh, in the bill to um, to to legalize um, recreational cannabis was that um, a, a certain proportion of the the revenue had to be set aside and reinvested into uh, violence prevention programs and, and workforce development programs, um, especially uh, those that assist um, formerly incarcerated people, um, because you know that I think that's an important uh, element of of uh, violence prevention. You know, we have to ensure that. Um, that there are opportunities for folks, you know, who are leaving the prison system to be able to find jobs um, and and to, you know, have a legal means of of making a living um, so that they don't revert back to um, um, illegal means. Right. And so you, that was a, an important part of our violence prevention um, program and our cannabis um, recreational cannabis legalization program. We also um, uh, included um, large investments in violence prevention programs in our uh, state budget last year. Um, and, um, you know, so that has to go hand in hand with efforts to uh, restrict access to um, illegal firearms and, and you know, to, um, uh, to make firearms less accessible to, to some. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done at the state to um, try to take a holistic approach at some of these issues. Um, and, and, you know, on an issue like, um, like um, immigration reform, even though you know that's done at the federal level, we have done a lot at the state level to um, you know make it um, make it a more humane place uh, for people to come, and you know that's been borne out in the last um, several weeks when we've um, welcomed uh, busloads of. Uh, migrants from the southern border, you know, that have been sent, um, you know, from Texas by um, a governor who wants to use human beings as pawns in his political game, right? So, you know, we've accepted over 2,000 um, um, migrants from uh, the southern border. And, you know, when Margaret mentioned that, I mean, you know, she's absolutely right that, you know, they're 
they're here for, for, for asylum, and so they are entitled to come. They're not illegal, um, but um, you know, they're in need of a lot of assistance, and um, our state has um, figured out uh, between the city and, and the state, we've figured out um, how to um, welcome them and uh, you know, get them settled so that um, you know, they're not um, basically, you know, discarded, like, you know, uh, um, you know, like they, you know, done to them in, in, in Texas and, and places like Texas and Florida. Um, I, I think that we do live in a much more humane um, state than, than many others. And, you know, we see this with, you know, the way that, um, we treat women, um, you know, in our uh, ability to protect um, women's reproductive rights, um, voting rights, immigrant rights. Um, these are all issues that I've worked on. I've had the privilege of working on in the General Assembly. <coughs> um, and, you know, I hope to continue to do that um, because um, I think that you know, with with power comes responsibility, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that you know it's all that um, you know I'm in this for for the power at all, but I'm saying that you know it is a lot of responsibility, um, you know, what we do, right? Because when we pass laws and get them passed in um, the House, you know, with the majority of 118 votes, and then in the Senate with the majority of um, 59 votes. Um, and a bill gets signed by the governor, they, uh, you know, those measures affect 13 million people across the state of Illinois. And, you know, so that's a lot of responsibility to think about, like, you know, when we do um, make those decisions to, um, to pass a bill, and it does take a lot to pass a bill. Um, it's a long, involved process. Um, but it's, it's also a great responsibility that, um, you know, I um, feel privileged to be a part of. Um, I also, as I said before in my presentation, I feel very um, privileged to do the work that I do because I do consider myself to be a public servant and that my responsibility, you know, my job description is to represent, right, to be the voice of the people that I've been elected to, uh, to, to represent and serve. And um, I enjoy the job and uh, feel privileged and fortunate to be able to do that every day. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to um, share a little bit about myself and um, to have this uh, conversation with all of you. Thank you. Okay, this, yes, will end our, yeah. this will end our formal presentation tonight for the College of Complexes. Our festivities are officially adjourned. We shall keep the Zoom call open for further moderation.